Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode four of our Future of Work show. Now, if you're like all of us, you might have seen organizations which have really made the most of uh, this crisis and have come up with very innovative responses. And then, of course, many of us have seen and perhaps are also working for organizations which are sort of waiting this time out to try and see you know, what future emerges and what their likely response is going to be after the pandemic. So to discuss this, I have with me today, Professor Arun Sharma. Professor Arun Sharma teaches at Miami Business School and he has been studying how leadership teams and organizations have responded to this pandemic. Uh, he works with several Fortune 500 companies and he consults, researches, and writes about them. So I'm just going to invite him into our show. Good morning, Professor Sharma. So nice to have you with us. Good, uh, yeah, good <laughs> afternoon for you. Thank you, Shalini, for uh, including me in your wonderful broadcast. No, such a pleasure. I know you and I have been in conversation over several months, exchanging ideas, um, articles, your research around, you know, so much of what you've been finding about how organizations and leadership teams have done through the pandemic. So I'm really, really interested in asking you lots of questions around some of these findings. But first, if I might, there's a question which I've been thinking of and perhaps never had the opportunity to ask. Uh, you started off in an area that wasn't quite, you know, around organizational adaptation or agility, but rather marketing. And then over a period of time, you moved towards your passion, uh, which is how do organizations adapt and how do they stay agile? And as you call them, liquid organizations. So I really wanted to understand a little bit about, you know, what is it that got you interested? How did this journey take place? And what are some of your So Shani, I think we're having some technical problems, but if you can hear me, I can start. Um, my interest was always in marketing. We started off with an interest in marketing and I gravitated towards not the elements of marketing, but towards markets. And in these markets, we started realizing and markets just says, how do firms and competitors behave in an industry and how does disruptions come in? So we started talking about disruptions. We started looking at disruptions and a lot of organizations came to us about three or four years ago and said, what's happening? Can you help us understand disruptions? So we spent about 18 months looking at disruptions. We classified them, we put them in nice buckets. And when we went back to organizations and started saying, this is how disruptions occur, they realized very quickly that um, it was unpredictable. So they said, well, that doesn't really help as much. Can you tell us how organizations can respond to disruptions and not be disrupted? And from there, we started again studying these organizations and we've been talking to folks for more than 30 years now. And we realized this concept that the organization has to be more liquid. And this is where we came to this concept of a liquid organization. And a liquid organization is an organization which is built for speed. And not only is it built for speed, but it should also be very flexible, which means it can change directions. It should be able to accelerate and de-accelerate, which means that the paths that they're going, that they don't want to go anymore, they should be able to stop and move to another path. And finally, they should be ambidextrous. And this ambidexterity comes from um, human beings, people who can use both the right and left hands uh, equally well. For an organization, uh, it is, what we call exploitation and exploration. Exploitation says, how do I get more from my current customers? And exploration says, how do I get new customers and create new products and services? And what we realized was that firms cannot do where both very well. So ambidexterity is very hard to get. So we put this package together and we called it liquidity. And I just want to give you an example that just to show you what liquidity stands is and just as with an example about 12 years ago apple introduced the iphone at that time the number one brand in the world was nokia with about 
38% market share. Number two was Samsung with about 15% market share. And number three was BlackBerry with about 14% market share. And the innovation was very simple. From keyboards, they went to a flat glass where you could just touch objects and use it as a both as a keyboard and to manipulate objects. And interestingly enough, both Nokia and BlackBerry were never able to catch up. Nokia was a quite was regarded as a speedy organization. They used to launch a phone every week, but they couldn't launch a different kind of phone. And so that's where my interest in liquidity came in. And as we started studying liquidity, we realized that perform, firms that perform better are typically more liquid. Industries that perform better are typically more liquid. And so in a really in a sort of long story, but that tells us where we, why we started with marketing and landed up in liquidity. Yeah, that's so interesting because this is the subject I did my doctoral research on. My doctoral research is all around what is it that enables organizations to be adaptive, particularly in the face of unforeseen business circumstances. Right. Uh, back when I was doing my PhD, the natural experiment was the financial crisis. Right. And so how did organizations respond to it? And it all boiled down to uh, the way communication and decision making happened within the organization. So flows of communication, how rich were they, how complex were they, and how did they flow, whether it was vertically, largely vertically, as in more traditional organizations, or were they rich channels of horizontal communication where there was you know, continuous sharing of ideas and information at peer level groups uh, across different levels of the organization? And of course, how decisions were made. Were they largely centralized, made by a small team, or were they you know, a combination of some decisions, of course, being centralized, but many, many decisions happening locally uh, by teams just understanding what's happening in their immediate environment and, you know, using that information to generate a response. So I completely understand what you're saying. It's obviously a topic which I'm, you know, extremely, extremely passionate about. Uh, one of the things I found absolutely interesting, Professor Sharma, about the work that you did was uh, that just a few weeks into the pandemic, and I, I think we had a conversation back in March, and you had already come up with research tracing how different organizations you work with were making decisions around their response to the pandemic. And it, right. you came up with some very, very interesting findings. And I'd love if you could talk a little bit about what those findings were. Uh, and in particular, the hub and spoke model that you shared. What did that look like? So um, let me give you a little bit of a background before I go there. We have looked at liquidity. And we think that four kinds of liquidity that drive a firm's liquidity. The first one is called liquid delivery which means what is the quality, speed, and innovation of the delivery of people and the organization? And this is where people talk about agility and agile organizations. The second is scale. And we call it liquid infrastructure, which means can we expand and uh, reduce the size of our uh, scale? Uh, the third one is called liquid people. And I think this is the most interesting of all four of them. And liquid people just says, are our people set in functional areas and roles, or are they flexible enough to move? And the final one is, we call it liquid geography, which was, can people work from any place? And we found that to be true, but now we are seeing that although people can work from multiple places, the entire issues of management of people and collaboration and innovation is suffering. And how do we control that becomes a larger issue. So uh, coming back to this, so let, let me just go through some of the research that we found, and then I'll just quickly uh, talk about uh, the team structures. So one of the first things we did was we did it in March, and we realized that firms and industries that were more liquid quickly started remote work, which was completely expected, and we found that to be true. Uh, we did another research project in which we found out that uh, liquidity increased dramatically during when the COVID-19 pandemic struck. But by May, the organizational, organizational structure and processes took over and liquidity had come down to 
the same level as February. So that's another research project that we found. We found that if you're liquid, your revenues drop less and your revenue recovery was much faster than if you were less liquid. Uh, we also find found that firms that were more liquid had higher customer satisfaction. So this was sort of all around it. And, and then finally, maybe we'll talk about it later. We we discuss the kind of skills people need. So let me go back and we started studying organizations and said, what are organizations doing in terms of addressing the pandemic? And there is this concept of teams that keeps coming up in liquidity, which suggests that look at firms operate in teams even within hierarchy. So you may have a hierarchy, but even within a hierarchy, you operate in teams. And teams are the speed booster, as we call it. So what we found was when we separated organizations, which were high liquidity and low liquidity, what we found was high liquidity firms immediately, the CEO typically created a focus team of six to eight members, and they addressed the broad issues. And each member of the team then went and established other teams. And we call it a hub and spoke system because each you had an internal circle, which may be the CEO. You had six people around them, which is a CFO, chief people office, et cetera. And then each of them went and created their own teams. We call this a hub and spoke system. And that is how they expanded the team structures and how they use team structures. And the more liquid the firm we found, the more linkages between teams. So if you think about even this kind of a team structure where we have one in the top, four teams underneath, or five teams underneath, and then 25 underneath, there was a hierarchical structure that was created. But the more liquid organizations immediately started creating connections between teams. And by creating connections between teams, rather than this structure, they just flattened it out. And that sort of is a structure that worked very well. There was another issue that came up, and I'm just giving you the broad strokes and then we can go into the particulars. The other issue that immediately came up was that if you are not liquid, the way you set up teams are used to take one person from every department. And we call it a committee. We really don't call it a team. And what we found was that committees just couldn't make decisions at the pace of organizational change. So in a broad sense, that's what we found. And do you think you could give an example of an organization that you think, and you don't need to necessarily name it, or you could, but just an example of how you know these teams were formed at a central level and what the spoke teams might have focused on and looked like, so that you know we all get a little bit of clarity around how this might actually play out in a live organization? So the way, so we, we I can talk about a Latin American uh, company that's based out of Miami, and they the way they structured it, the organization was they. It, it may be better if I sh if I talk about another example, which is much more interesting, I think, and much more immediate. So, a lot of medical devices companies in the U.S. have their production facilities in Puerto Rico. And when we had Hurricane Maria come through, what happened was the entire power grid collapsed. And there was nothing, and the production just came to an end. And they were responsible for about 30 to 40% of the production that came into the US came out of Puerto Rico. So what these organizations did was at a high level, just got four or five of the most competent people into a, into a team. And then the team, created a task list and irrespective of the skills of the person, they were given tasks. So we had the legal person leasing aircraft so that they could take generators into Puerto Rico. And what, what that did was, and this was a classic example of both team structures and liquid people, they were people who were working and excelling in areas outside their functional expertise. And they were able to start by creating these kinds of structures, which means that about four or five people in the top, and then each one of them. So when you have aircraft leasing, then you need to have people who are loading, unloading, it's secure areas. How do we get them? How do we get stuff here? And they formed their own teams underneath it. So the aircraft people had their own team just looking at putting things in aircrafts and taking things up to aircraft. There was a people team because 
the once the power grid collapsed, then there were no cellular phones. So how do we contact workers and bring them back? There was a third piece to the puzzle. There was not enough water because again, when the power grid collapses, you have no water. So they didn't have enough water. So how do we get water to them? And of course there was food issues, et cetera. So each one of them set up their own teams and each one addressed one piece of the business. And there were literally people on motorcycles going around and telling workers it's going to open. And they were able to open the factories within 72 hours, which was an absolute record. But once again, this is the way that they structured the, the teams. So what you're saying from what I understand is that when the crisis first began, uh, at least in some of the organizations which had a very uh, innovative, had the ability to respond to this crisis early enough, you saw a sort of crisis team come together, right. uh, which had representatives from many different functional areas and where people, in a sense, loosely held their functional hats Absolutely. through that process. And that team, which was a leadership level team, then you know just looked at the problem holistically and then decided which were the key action uh, you know, areas. And each of the team members then in turn led in the hub and spoke model, a small team of uh, uh, you know, people who would focus on that particular aspect of response. And that's a response that allowed for very quick responsiveness. Absolutely. So just as a simple example, there's a team that just looked at food and water and they quickly realized that they could not only do food and water for the workers, they had to bring food and water for the family of the workers. Wow. Because you know, then otherwise the workers couldn't come. They quickly realized that uh, there were children at home who were going to school and they suddenly couldn't go to school. So how do I so they set up a team whose job was to take care of children while people worked. And so there was a they would quickly made teams and these teams were not functional based. They were more competence based. And they said, who's the most competent person to take care of this? And that's the person that they did. You know, what's so interesting, Professor Sharma, is that uh, a few months ago when the lockdown began uh, and I started my own research of, you know, how are some of the organizations here responding and adapting? I found many versions of the same. Uh, so in one organization, which is largely brick and mortar and ran outlets, uh, actually 400 outlets across the country, uh, they took a decision to go digital within a few days, actually four days. And when I asked a little more around the process of this decision making, it was one where people left their functional hats aside, wore business problem hats. Uh, including in the leadership team, looked at the problem as a whole, and it's something similar to what you're speaking about. Uh, the few things that were perhaps different were that many of these ideas in this particular organization, for instance, came as a result of informal one-on-one -on -one conversation. So the first few days or the early days of the pandemic, because you know it was almost like, I think, uh, you know, the sky fell all of a sudden overnight. And uh, there were just so many conversations, uh, you know, one on ones between different people uh, across the organization and within leadership teams uh, that they decided uh, that if anything sounds even somewhat promising, they were going to give it a shot and see where it took them. So they decided they would each form their own teams who would then experiment with different pieces of this challenge of how do we go digital you know really quickly and uh, come up with a solution so i can see that and i and i can also see just how challenging this would be to maintain because this is not how organizations typically work our roles our functional hats are you know uh, our areas of expertise hierarchy, you know, all of the structural uh, features of an organization uh, run quite counter to this style of working. So I wonder what you think about that and how does this play over a period of time? Very, very, very good question. I, I, I think, um, so I, I'll give you two examples. So let me start with the first one. There's a company called Panera Bread Company in the US, which is a fast casual restaurant. 
And uh, they decided as soon as the pandemic struck in about a week that they realized that not enough people will come to fo for food. So they realized it was, they started uh, both selling and delivering um, groceries to consumers. It took them about two weeks to do that. And the, it was not successful. Uh, as, as a strategy, it was not successful. But when you talk to the senior leadership at Panera, they will tell you that it's it's uh, it's good for us to do these things because liquidity is like a muscle. If you don't use it, it just decays. So that's one of the uh, points I wanted to make. The second point I want to make is that hierarchy, hierarchies are natural. So there is a law called the constru construal law, which basically says that the shape of things invariably, whenever there's a flow of any kind, whether it's information, whether it's water the f or heat, the flow, the natural design looks like a tree with a big trunk in the middle and branches going out. And if you look at a tree, you realize that that's what an organization looks like. So naturally, organizations will move towards hierarchies. It just is. And the examples that they give is, you know, a delta looks like a tree. So when you look at a river delta, it looks like a tree. If you look at heat sinks, they look like trees. And there are lots and lots of examples that you can, you know, our blood, the way our blood flows, our circulatory system. Like fractals, fractal designs. Right. And similar so, to fractal designs. Yeah, yes, and that looks like a tree, right? So there is a natural tendency towards hierarchies. There just is. So organizations have to constantly fight against hierarchies. And the only way that you can be liquid and remain liquid is to constantly fight against a natural tendency to become hierarchical. It just organizations operate at much more, I should say, much more peace when they live in a hierarchy. Liquidity is turbulence. And when it's turbulent, people have a uh, harder time living in that organization. And, and most of the hierarchies come because of process control. And you're trying to control 1% of error rates or 0.5% of the error rates, and you create huge hierarchies to control the process so you don't get this 0.5% errors. And that, the natural tendency is to do this. So anything goes wrong, they say, who approved it? That's what organizations say. Well, there's no approval process. This guy decided and did it. Well, we need an approval process here. We suddenly started building hierarchies, and that's what happens. So do you think this is like a, you know, almost like a turning point for some organizations who have managed to find a response? Or do you think this is a temporary response that will sort of die out as the pandemic does? So, Shali, something really interesting started happening. What we found was that companies that were not liquid or had low liquidity, they demonstrated higher liquidity when pandemic came. They became a smaller group. They made quick decisions. They implemented decisions very quickly. But what we found by May, the less liquid organizations had gone back to the normal way of functioning. Mm -hmm. The hierarchies again imposed uh, structures on it which reduced liquidity of the organization. However, we found that if your liquidity was higher, you are a high liquidity firm, they took advantage of this time and made themselves more liquid. So their liquidity also wow. rose in March, April, but what they were able to do was to lead the liquidity and not let the hierarchies drop the liquidity. And so what's happened in this era, and when we come out of coronavirus, what we'll notice is that the gap between low liquidity and high liquidity firms will actually increase. And almost low liquidity firms are in deep, deep trouble because we don't know when changes come going to, when the stable environments are going to emerge. We don't know that. So as long as change is taking place, we find that uh, these high liquidity firms are doing very, very well. How's and I, I do also just one more point I wanted to make. We used to have very stable environments. So, you know, Alfred Sloan started these uh, this hierarchical organization, and this is the 1920s. But we had very stable environments. So hierarchies work very well in stable environments when there's not much change taking place outside. When there's dramatic changes taking place outside the firm, hierarchies don't seem to have the ability 
to match the change in the environment. Yeah. No, I think that's absolutely fascinating, Professor Sharma, because what you're saying is that through the pandemic, in a sense, the gap's gotten wider. Those which had a, an existing capacity for agility, liquidity, uh, some of those organizations developed it even further and through the process of responding to the pandemic have would expect them to come out the other end even more agile and innovative than they were going in. Right. But on the other hand, what you've seen is that organizations which were inherently less liquid, uh, more reliant on hierarchies and processes and structures, uh, tried some of the liquid practices uh, in the early days and perhaps even got some positive outcomes. But the gravity of these uh, structures, processes, uh, you know, was, was so strong that uh, soon after that wasn't a very sustainable position. And they went back to, you know, some of the processes uh, that guided them pre-pandemic. And, you know, as you were saying, and we all know that this is going to be a huge challenge for organizations as to try and respond to an environment which has so completely shifted from the environment in which organizations were created, right. which was say about a hundred years ago at the back of you know the one of the earlier industrial revolutions. So right. the fundamental playing ground has changed. Organizations, however, haven't changed as much, uh, right. despite all this evidence and conversation, the reality is that there are very few examples of organizations which are structured very differently from the norm in that of that particular industry. So uh, it's going to be a very interesting time uh, going ahead. Are there any particular... Sorry. sorry? No, all I was saying was that we find that digi uh, digital native firms seem to have maintained the liquidity even when they get into yeah. size. So companies yeah. like uh, Amazon are really good at maintaining liquidity. Interestingly enough, size in itself is not a detriment. And you realize that Walmart has enhanced its liquidity dramatically over the last three or four years. So it's not, it has to, it has to come from internal that we want to be more liquid. I'm sorry, no. No, no. In, in fact, that leads to my last question that is there a particular leadership mindset Say a, which is, you know, say a more liquid mindset that promotes this kind of organization responsiveness. So what we find is, you know, this you know, people talk about the various kinds of CEOs, but if your leadership is an imperial CEO, which means I know and you 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 just follow me, that that doesn't lead to liquidity. I think what we found is that the CEOs have which have a deep learning orientation, deep listening skills. Those are the folks who are who develop more liquid organizations. Uh, we believe that, um, interesting enough, we looked at data also. We find the US organizations are the most liquid globally, followed by Asia and followed by Europe. And I think this if your CEO believes in hierarchies, then your organization just cannot be liquid. That's what lands the problem. So I just can't resist asking you about this difference that you're seeing geographically. Right. Uh, you know, what might be at the heart of this? So I think organizations are a reflection of the society. And liquid organizations come from more egalitarian societies where people believe that, that everybody has the has it has the intelligence has the capabilities to do well so you know I, I look at a very simple thing that you know i believe that can you go to your boss and use the first name to talk to him are you going to go to your ceo and use the first name of the ceo to talk to him or her and if you can't then you know you live in a much more hierarchical society and in, a, in that society it's much much harder to become liquid. That's what I see. So we, even when we go to Asia and we go to Europe and we look at these, what we call digitally native firms, we find that they have broken down the hierarchy. I mean, literally the new employee will go and say, George, I, mean, I, I think we can do it better. And George will say, yeah, of course, 
tell me how we can do it better. That's the difference. Whereas if you go to a hierarchical organization and you say, George, I can do it better, the guy looks and says, who's this guy? And that's the difference. I, I, think, I think there's a societal reflection. Hierarchies, hierarchical societies create hierarchical organizations. No, I think you've got something there, though I must add that what we've seen in many of the Asian countries, uh, definitely in India and many others, is that when some of these practices like first name, et cetera, are introduced sort of externally as a, you know, it's a standalone practice. This is how you need to address each yeah. other. And it doesn't really sit well with anything. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't fit into the real uh, organization or the real society. Right. It sits very uneasily and almost to the point of being maybe a little insincere because it's right. you know it's it's like an imposed custom instead of being a true reflection of you know a very different way of working so i completely understand what you're saying i mean right. this whole field of cross cultural management and how uh, you know geographical uh, beliefs cultural beliefs impact uh, management styles and leadership would absolutely absolutely back everything you say right. so uh, i have a few questions from some of our viewers. Okay. Um, Jatin Malik asks, uh, how do you define exponential growth at which Amazon is growing? Is this permanent disruption or is Amazon immortal? <laughs> a difficult one. <laughs> so I, I, this is a very interesting question. I like the question. It's quite insightful. So Amazon grows to me till its liquidity is high. So think about what Amazon has been able to do. It went from selling books to selling merchandise and you say, oh, that's an easy one. That's not a, that's, you know, everybody can scale up into doing various merchandise. Then it goes and creates a new business and they're the ones who created it, which is AWS, which is Amazon Web Services, which is this entire cloud-based infrastructure. And that's where the profits of Amazon come. So you create this entire structure, which is completely outside your area of expertise, but you do a great job. Then they go and start creating uh, content, which is their prime video. Again, completely different area, completely uh, different context. And finally, they start making these devices such as Alexa, et cetera. And you are in such different businesses and you grow because the pace of growth in different businesses is different and that's what they end up doing. So anytime they become less liquid, more functional, more vertical based, you'll find that the slow growth starts slowing down. So I can, all I would say is that Amazon is a classic example of liquidity, which they've fluidly moved between different verticals or different industries and do a great job there. Wonderful, it makes sense. Ajay Chandra asks, how could startups and MSMEs be designed to be liquid right from the start, I guess? So uh, interesting thing about startups are they're liquid. So whenever, whenever you look at startups, they're liquid. And that's why we want to be like startups. And that's why large organizations want to look like startups and be liquid. So startups, uh, one person doesn't do one functional area job. They do everything from answering phones to, you know, uh, packing stuff and shipping stuff. And so small enterprises or startups by the sheer nature are liquid. The challenge is how to grow and remain liquid. The challenge is not how do I as a startup be liquid? The challenge is how do I grow and remain liquid? Because size is negatively correlated with liquidity because size imposes processes, process controls, which reduces liquidity. So the good news is if you're a startup, you're already liquid. So we don't have to worry much about you. <laughs> yeah, but what you said contains a very important reality that right. uh, that liquidity then needs to be treasured. Exactly. And for what it is, a strength. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, if I go back even a few years, every small successful startup wanted to be structured like a more established organizations and established organizations are not designed for innovation and agility so the mental models which uh, you know uh, we've had because that's all we've seen are those of established organizations which are 
it's very structured, very process oriented, but not necessarily agile. So that's really, I think, where the challenge is. Uh, question from Dr. Sugato Palit. Uh, Professor Sharma, your initial comments are interesting. However, industry is too wide a term to define businesses with different contextual realities. Ability, liquidity, agility is quite closely related to the business model and products. Request your thoughts on the same. So I don't know how to respond to that. I do not believe that product and service drives liquidity. I believe that industries are driven towards liquidity by the competitive pressures that they have and the nature of the business and the competitive pressures that they have. So I'll give you a simple example. You look at airlines. Airlines are a logistical nightmare. It's a very, very hard uh, logistically. Uh, it's, it's a hard business logistically. So the question that arrives is, so because we have so much process control and we have tons of process control in airlines, one would believe that the airline should by sheer nature not be liquid. But the airline business have made money for so few years that by nature they are very, very liquid. I always give this example. You know, if, if an airline like Qatar Airline wants to open the Miami market and fly into Miami from Doha, they literally have to have nobody on the ground for them to fly in. Uh, they can outsource, and which they do, by the way. They can outsource check-in. They can outsource all the areas of getting people into the plane, from check-in to getting them into the plane. They outsource food. They outsource fuel. They outsource luggage services. They outsource almost everything. The only thing that they don't outsource is their crew, which comes today and will return tomorrow. And so by sheer nature, but if you looked at this industry 40 years ago, they would have a huge office in Miami just taking care of this single flight. And so the example is it's the it's not the nature of the industry, it's the nature of the competitors of an industry that define whether that industry is liquid or not. And what happens over time, which is what happened in the US and all over the world, including India, what happened was if the airline was not liquid, it went bankrupt. So the only ones who survived were the airlines that were liquid. It's very insightful. So that's what my suggestion is. My feeling is in this area. There's a final question by uh, Ravi Kingrani. How is agility different from liquidity? So as I started off talking in the beginning, uh, liquidity has four elements. Liquid delivery, which is your speed and innovation of your outcomes. Uh, speed, quality, and innovation of your outcomes. Um, and agility typically, and what we call what we call the agile way of method, typically just focuses on the delivery piece of it. The second one is liquid infrastructure, which means how come, how fast can we scale up or scale down a process? Uh, most companies are better at scaling up than scaling down. The third piece of it, and by the way, the agility has nothing to say to that. The third piece is. Uh, liquid people and liquid people has turned out to be the most important in liquidity which means are your people truly able to move across functional areas and do different things and for that they need a learning orientation and we do not hire people for learning orientation we hire people for functional skills and every time you hire somebody for a functional skill rather than learning orientation you're reducing the liquidity of your organization so that's the third piece of it and the fourth piece is liquid geography, which means how do I um, how do I manage my customers and my people across geographic distances? And this had never come up before, and now it's becoming more and more prominent uh, with COVID-19. So long answer, but what we call is the agile working is just related to liquid delivery and not the other three aspects of liquidity. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. I think it's almost um, it's perhaps a, almost a misfortune that the agile software method has so overpowered the vocabulary that agile has, you know, so strongly come to represent some of those philosophical foundations, which, by the way, are wonderful in their own way. But the word itself, agile, has uh, you know been taken over by uh, by a particular methodology. 
Professor Sharma. Sandy, can I add one more thing? So yeah, as an yeah, example, absolutely. when we talk about our infrastructure of scaling people, one of the things we talk about is, do your people have enough time to do strategic thinking? Do they take time off, which is two hours in the on a morning on Friday, and just go through the week and say, what worked, what didn't work, what do I need to fix long term, rather than the short term fixes that we are doing? Some people do it in the morning and in the afternoon. In the morning, they'll plan the day. In the afternoon, they'll say what worked, what didn't work. And this is a great example. If you do that, you become more liquid and your organization becomes more liquid. And the entire agile methodology has not at all looked at these kinds of things which increase the speed and flexibility of an organization. I'm sorry. I just wanted to no. add to that portion so that there's a clarity of what liquidity is when compared to agile, agile organizations. That's very, very helpful. Thank you so much, Professor Sharma. I realize we are we're a little bit over time. Thank you for staying on a few extra minutes. There were some great questions and very, very insightful responses. You know, one of the things I want to share about Professor Sharma is that um, just days after the whole pandemic had started, his research had already reached a stage where he was at least sharing articles and writing about that. Now, for anyone who's familiar with academia, you'll know that that is truly a rarity. Most academic research uh, you know, happens over months or usually years. So uh, I would expect the academic research on the pandemic to emerge perhaps next year or even the year after that. So it's extremely rare to find an academic who is so in tune with you know, the needs uh, or the conversations in the, in the business world that within days and weeks, uh, you know, he came up with his early articles and research. And he comes up with a newsletter every two weeks, which again, for those who are, have any familiarity with academics would know just how rare it is. So thank you so much, Professor Sharma. It has been such an honor to have you with us. And uh, I, am, uh, I just loved so many of the answers that you've given, I think, for me, for our viewers, for anyone who's going to watch this. Uh, we're going to take so much with us about what it's going to take to design organizations of the future and what that kind of liquidity is going to encompass, along with really what are going to be some of the big challenges in the process. Uh, and actually, I think one huge challenge is going to be the fact that uh, we haven't done this before or not enough organizations have done this before for there even to be a picture, a very clear picture of what that looks like in practice. And I think that's a huge, huge challenge. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Shalini, thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure. I love the uh, questions that the audience had, and hopefully we will can do this again sometime. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So thank you for staying with us. It was such a pleasure to discuss this with Professor Sharma. As I said, he has just been amazing in his research around the pandemic and how leadership teams and organizations all across the world have been responding to this. Uh, this uh, conversation will be available both on LinkedIn uh, and on Uncube's uh, website uh, uh, later today. So uh, do have another look if there were any questions that you wanted to go over again. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, next week, uh, next Saturday, we have with us uh, Mr. Rajiv Dube, who is the ex CHRO of the Mahindra Group. And we're going to talk about some of the challenges that Indian organizations face, and particularly traditional Indian organizations, when they move towards transformation uh, you know, in just the way the Mahindra Group has. So stay with us. Follow Uncube uh, on our LinkedIn page. Uh, visit our website. Uh, both Jess Fries and I uh, put out uh, an article every week. Um, Jaspreet, uh, my co-founder, works on business and technology, and I work on people and organizations. Thank you so much for being with us.